Hi, my name is Michael Seidman. I am an otorhinolaryngologist, head and neck surgeon, also known as an ear, nose, and throat surgeon. I received my Bachelor of Science degree in nutrition and a medical degree both from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. I did my residency training in otolaryngology and then a fellowship in hearing, balance, facial nerve, skull base, acoustic neuroma, and cochlear implant surgery at the Ear Research Foundation in Florida. Vertigo is a term that describes a sensation of motion. Often people who suffer with vertigo tell me that they are dizzy. Dizziness can also refer to such feelings as lightheadedness, unsteadiness, wooziness, confusion, giddiness, a sensation of being pulled, a sensation of walking on a waterbed, a floating sensation, a feeling of being on a boat, or just getting off a roller coaster. The list goes on and on. Typically, describing the sensation that my patients are experiencing is very difficult for most people with balance problems to do. Balance problems are very common, with more than 40% of patients over the age of 75 experiencing such problems. Actually, 7 million visits are paid to doctors each year for the symptom of dizziness or vertigo. And more than 70% of patients with true vertigo have an inner ear source for the balance problem, which is why it's so hard to get in to see us sometimes. The feeling of imbalance without a turning or a spinning sensation is not usually due to an inner ear problem. And there are literally thousands of causes for balance disturbances, many of which have nothing to do with your ears or your brain. Neuroautologists, which is what I am, are otolaryngologists, head and neck surgeons who have a particular interest in hearing and balance disorders and have taken a fellowship beyond residency to study these types of problems. I'd like you to take a look at this picture of the ear here and you can see how complex it is. Now, the ear is made up into three places. There is the external ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. The external ear starts from the outside of the ear called the helix. It includes the external auditory canal and it goes up to the eardrum. In the external auditory canal is where wax is, for example. If you have a blockage here, it can be irritating and can also cause some hearing loss. Now, the middle ear starts on the inside surface of the eardrum and it consists of the three of the smallest bones in our body called the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, also called their hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. It is an air-containing space that connects to the back of the nose via the eustachian tube. Now, if you look at the smallest bone of hearing, the stapes bone, it's the smallest bone in our body, right at that point on the inside surface of that starts the inner ear. And the inner ear consists of two major components, the vestibular component, which is responsible for balance. It has three semicircular canals, a saccule, and a utricle. And also the cochlea, which is the snail shell-shaped organ responsible for hearing. And then both of these are connected to nerves or via nerves into the brain. And you can see that the nerves to balance from the vestibular system are here, as well as the nerve for the cochlea or the hearing nerve and the facial nerve all sit inside this little tiny internal auditory canal. And right here is where small tumors called acoustic neuromas, for example, can grow. Now, this picture, as you can see, is very complicated. And there's a lot going on inside the inner ear. And with this, now that you have an understanding of problems that can occur inside here, a complex interaction of the inner ear coupled with two other sensory systems maintains our balance. So we have the three semicircular canals in the left ear and three semicircular canals in the right. The somatosensory system, which means the brain, the spinal cord, muscles and joints, and the visual system. One way to understand this is to think of the three systems as legs of a tripod, just like this. The inner ear, the central nervous system, and the visual system. These three systems are all necessary to maintain proper balance, and disorders of any of these can cause balance problems. Interestingly, we know that people can function relatively well with two of the three systems, but when you develop a problem in one of the remaining two systems, serious balance problems occur. For example, people who have had diabetes for years may develop an inability to feel the floor with their feet. This is a somatosensory problem. By day, they may have little trouble maintaining their balance. However, if they get up in the middle of the night when it's dark to use a restroom, they often find that they are very unsteady. What has happened is that they, normally they are living with two of the three legs of that tripod intact, namely the inner ear and the vestibular system, as well 
of the, is the vision. Since the somatosensory component is not functioning well because of the diabetes, when you turn out the lights, you remove the second of the three systems or the legs of the tripod necessary for good balance, thus leaving only the vestibular system, and therefore the balance is off. Even people with severe back or neck problems, such as arthritis, can have problems with their balance, again having nothing to do with the inner ear. One very important aspect in trying to sort out the causes of balance problems includes finding if there are any ear symptoms. Specifically, I am interested in whether there is any unexplained hearing loss, fluctuation to your hearing, does it affect one or both ears, is there any fullness, blockage, or pressure sensations in the ear that is not related to allergic problems, being on an airplane, or being in the mountains? Is there any ringing, also called tinnitus, buzzing or roaring in the ears? Typically, all patients and all people have experienced these symptoms to some degree, but the primary concern is if there is any relationship to the balance problems. It is also important for us to know if there are any specific neurologic symptoms. What I mean by a neurologic symptom is something that points to the brain, or a brain cause rather than an ear cause. For example, is there any history of, con of loss of consciousness, confusion, unexplained headaches, migraine symptoms, changes in your vision, weakness or numbness of part of your body, just to name a few. Your past medical history is also very important to me. Knowing whether there are any preceding bacterial or viral illnesses is important, such as the flu or the common cold, for example. These infections can actually localize to the inner ear and potentially cause balance or hearing problems. Other common causes of balance disturbance is, something, is, is head trauma, such as hitting your head in a car accident, falling off a ladder. There are also many chronic diseases that can cause disequilibrium, such as diabetes, low blood sugar or high blood sugar, severe allergy disorders, thyroid abnormalities, cardiac disease, heart disease, and blood pressure alterations, both high and low, smoking and alcohol use. Medications are probably one of the most common causes of balance problems, and there are more than 5,000 medications listed that can cause imbalance. So you should consult your pharmacist or your primary care physician regarding these medications that may be causing dizziness. Before your consultation with me or one of my colleagues, it is helpful and highly recommended that you have had an extensive evaluation by your primary medical care doctor. This will help rule out other possible causes of balance disorders. It is important that they give particular attention to the cardiac or heart and the neurologic or brain systems. It is also helpful if they have done a metabolic evaluation. That might include such things as blood sugar testing, blood pressure, electrolytes, which are chemicals in your body, sometimes a thyroid test, sometimes not. And there are many other studies that may or may not need to be done. After you have had an extensive evaluation by your primary medical doctor, you will have an evaluation by me or one of my associates. This includes a complete otolaryngologic head and neck examination and a directed neurologic examination that will include tests of your cranial nerves. These are nerves that let you smile, close your eyes tight, move your tongue, shrug your shoulders, the list goes on. I will also test eye movements and balance testing such as walking a straight line or stepping tests. Other objective tests that may be done are a comprehensive hearing test that takes about 30 minutes. I may also recommend an auditory brainstem response test, but not that often. And this is a test where they put small electrodes on your head, they put clicking inside your ear, and it looks specifically at the hearing nerve. And it tells us if there's any kinds of problems with that hearing nerve. That takes about an hour to do. There is also specific balance testing that I may need to do, such as an ENG, that stands for electronystagmography. What they do is they put the same kind of electrodes that I just described on your head. They have you follow some lights on the wall. They put some cold and warm water in your ears. Most people tolerate this very well and don't get too dizzy, but it can make you a little bit off balance when they do that. And that test takes about an hour and a half. And what that lets us do is to know whether it's the right ear that's involved or the left ear that's involved. So it does allow us to localize. It can also tell us if there are some brain problems. Another test that you might have is called the rotational chair test. The rotational chair test is when you sit in a chair and they actually rotate the chair back and forth to the left or to the right. Um, you're in a dark booth and you have the same electrodes on your head. Now, what they can tell us with this is whether the brain is involved or whether the inner ear is involved, but it can't tell us right or left ear. 
On rare occasion, I shouldn't say rare occasion, occasionally I may also perform a test called platform posturography. Now platform posturography is a test where you stand on a platform and we are able to manipulate your visual field and the somatosensory system. So we can actually mess with those types of things and we can isolate each of those three legs of the tripod on its own. I primarily do this for people who have disequilibrium or imbalance problems. So most of my patients don't have to go through this. If you have true vertigo, I'm probably not going to ask you to go through the platform posturography test. There's another test called an electrocochleography. This is a test that I rarely do, but it essentially helps us to know whether you might have increased pressure inside your inner ear. Now, this is not your middle ear or your external ear, but your inner ear, as you recall. And this test is something that people who work with a lot of patients with Meniere's disease, as I do, some say it's very helpful, some say it's not, and I occasionally will do this type of test. These tests that I have discussed help us in the localization of your particular problem and can possibly affect the treatment recommendations that I give you. Often after completing this extensive evaluation, we, we may still not be able to learn the source of your balance problem. And I may recommend either a CAT scan or an MRI. Now, these are types of scans that we use. The CAT scan uses radiation, so you're actually exposed to radiation. It doesn't give us as good of a picture as an MRI, and typically for these problems, I am recommending an MRI, which stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging. Now, Magnetic Resonance Imaging is a long tube. You go inside this. There's a fairly loud noise. Some machines are a clicking pop, 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 pop sound that's very loud. They will give you uh, earplugs, and if you go to a place that doesn't give them to you, I would recommend that you bring them with you just to protect your, your ears. They will usually start an IV and give you a contrast agent called gadolinium. If you're allergic to CAT scan dyes, you are almost never allergic to the MRI dye, but you need to tell the doctor who's doing these types of things. Now, for some of you, the MRI may be claustrophobic inducing. And for patients of mine who have that problem, if you would tell me, I can prescribe some Valium for you beforehand, but you'll need a driver to bring you home. The MRI gives us a beautiful picture inside the brain and inside the inner ear. From time to time, it may be indicated for me to send you to a neurologist for further evaluation. Once we have ruled out potential dangerous causes of balance disturbances, we can talk about treatment options that may exist. This particular video will discuss Meniere's disease in some detail. In the late 1800s, Prosper Meniere recognized a disorder characterized by four symptoms. Number one is true spells of vertigo. Two is fluctuating hearing loss. Three is oral or ear fullness or pressure. And four is roaring tinnitus or tinnitus. The problem is caused by a buildup of inner ear fluid called endolymph. And sometimes this disease is called endolymphatic hydrops. The exact cause for this buildup of fluid is unknown, but it is thought to be because either too much fluid is made or too little absorption is occurring in the endolymphatic sac. On rare occasion, we can actually see something called delayed endolymphatic hydrops. This occurs after someone has either had a severe hearing loss or deafness for many years, and then gradually starts getting spells of dizziness. This problem can occur after head trauma as well, but it's unusual, or it can occur because of autoimmune inner ear problems as well. And that's where you have like a lupus type of a disorder, where it can actually affect the inner ear, and that typically will affect both ears, but it's fairly unusual. The diagnosis of Meniere's disease is a clinical one. That is, the diagnosis is made from the history that you tell me. There are some classic findings with objective tests, namely a low frequency hearing loss seen on a hearing test. The balance testing, the ENG in particular, may range from normal to abnormal. It is helpful if we find a weakness in one of the inner ears, but this is not always the case. One other test worth mentioning is the electrocochleography or ECOG. It is a test used by some physicians, while others do not give it much credence. The test may be abnormal or normal in the same patient at different times. And it is a test that I do not routinely order, but it lets us know about the pressure in the inner ear. Sometimes a CAT scan or an MRI scan may be indicated to rule out other problems. Patients with Meniere's disease typically tell us that their ear becomes full or blocked, usually one ear. Then they get a roaring sound in that one ear. The hearing then goes out followed by severe rotational or spinning vertigo. The spinning usually lasts from 15 minutes up to 12 hours, with the average being one to three hours. Following the attacks, the symptoms resolve and patients often feel normal. Their hearing gets better, the ringing goes away. Some patients will still feel off for a day or so. The primary treatment options are to restrict your salt, caffeine, alcohol, fatty foods, and simple sugars. 
This serves to enhance your diet and to reduce the overall fluid volume in your body and thus reduce the endolymph. Often, I will prescribe a diuretic or a water pill, which serves to reduce the amount of fluid in your body and then hopefully in your inner ear as well. Typically, I prescribe diazide one pill a day. Diazide is preferred because unlike other diuretics, diazide does not waste potassium. Lasix is a more powerful diuretic and it also requires that you take potassium supplements. In general, while on a diuretic, to have a banana or an orange is really recommended because it's a very good source of potassium. If the hearing dramatically goes down or if you are early on in your symptoms, I may recommend a one-week trial of steroids. On occasion, steroids have made the attacks go away for quite some time. There are, of course, significant potential side effects with steroids, such as irritability, mood swings. So I tell my patients if they're in a good mood, it may make them happier. If they're in a bad mood, it may make them more grouchy. It can cause stomach upset with the potential for stomach ulcers. It can increase your appetite, so some people can also have some weight gain, usually not more than several pounds. And one of the more severe reactions is a drug reaction, where the hip bone can become weak and you can actually fracture the hip. It's called aseptic necrosis of the hip, and you can actually need a hip transplant. Having said this, I've treated thousands and thousands of patients with steroids without any significant problems. So most of these side effects are really relatively well tolerated, um, especially because I use medicine for seven to 10 days. Many other medications have been tried, including histamine and a non-FDA approved drug called Circ. Now Circ is a drug that's not approved for use in the United States, but it's frequently used in Canada. And they have found that it helps up to 80% of their patients with Meniere's disease, and there have been many European studies. I've actually worked hard trying to get that drug approved here in the United States, but so far we've been fairly unsuccessful. So since I'm in Michigan, I have the luxury of being about 20 minutes from the border. I will sometimes send my patients, if they are interested, to Canada. You're pretty much on your own, though, and I say, go find a doctor, a medical doctor over there, and you can take my note with you and, and tell them that you have Meniere's disease and your doctor wants you to try Circ. The only major side effect with CERC is that it can cause some stomach problems. And if you have ulcer history, it's considered relatively contraindicated, meaning they tell you not to take it. Medical management may also include the use of antivert, also called meclizine, dramamine, scopalamine, or valium. And this is usually used for the vertigo when it's quite severe. Surgical management is usually reserved for people who continue to have these problems despite medical management. There are many procedures described, but I will discuss the four most commonly used procedure, and you can refer to them over here as well. Number one is the endolymphatic sac surgery. This is an outpatient procedure, so you come in the morning, go home the same day. It takes about one to one and a half hours to do. You come in in the morning, and the operation is designed to uncover the endolymphatic sac. I will then typically incise the sac and stent it open. Other surgeons just uncover the sac or decompress it. Some surgeons actually completely remove the sac. Fairly unusual. Although this operation has the lowest chance for major complications and it's an outpatient procedure, it is also the least effective overall. The percentage of patients with significant vertigo control at two to five years is about 50%. Overall, however, I find that approximately 75% of my patients who have had this operation do not feel the need to progress with more aggressive surgical options. The most common complications with the procedure are bleeding and infection. Hearing loss can occur in about 5% of patients, but it's not very common. To me, the biggest problem is persistent balance problems, which can occur in about half of my patients. Because you're operating on the ear, there's a risk to the facial nerve with resultant facial paralysis. This risk is felt to be about one out of a thousand times, but I use a facial nerve monitor, which reduces the risk of injury to the facial nerve, but does not guarantee it. And I have done several thousand ear operations, and really I've never had that nerve injured, but it is a, a risk. You can also get change or loss of sense of taste because the taste nerve runs right through the middle ear space. Cerebral spinal fluid leak and meningitis can occur because we're very close to the brain, but both are very rare, and I've actually never had that happen from this particular operation. And again, I've already mentioned no improvement in your vertigo attacks, which is roughly half of the patients. Typically, the recovery period is short, and I have, pip, have most people back to work within one to three days, on average about a week. Some have suggested that this operation is no better than a placebo procedure. There was the Dana Sham study, which actually they took patients, and this can't be done in the United States, thank, thank goodness, but they took patients, did a fake operation, they did the real operation, and found no difference uh, between the two. 
I was recently asked to write a book chapter, and I wrote a chapter about Meniere's disease. We have several different manuscripts that I've written on this subject. And I sent out a survey to 600 neurootologists, which is what I do, around the world. And that's about how many there are around the world. And this was still considered the most commonly done procedure. Where I trained in Florida with Dr. Herb Silverstein, one of the top several ear guys in the world, he thinks that the endolymphatic sac surgery should not be done. And he actually developed the vestibular neurectomy operation uh, one that I've done many, uh, many times, and it's a very good procedure. Uh, this is an operation that I do with a neurosurgeon. The reason is because we're operating inside your brain to clip that balanced nerve. This procedure takes about three to four hours. It requires a stay in the intensive care unit, usually overnight, and then about a three to seven day hospital admission. Most people are out of the hospital within three to four days. Patients will usually experience a severe attack of vertigo because I've clipped that nerve, and that gradually improves. The quicker we can get you up and walking, the faster you will recover. So the residents that I teach and work with will come by and kick you out of bed as quickly as you can, and so will I, because the faster we get you up and walking, the better you'll be. The percentage of patients with significant vertigo control at two to five years is about 91 to 93 percent. Thus, from a vertigo control standpoint, this is an excellent option. The risk of hearing loss is about 10 percent, but I've already done several hundred of these, and I've not had anybody lose their hearing from the surgery. The major complications to consider are, again, bleeding, infection, hearing loss, 10% overall, but in my hands, pretty much 0 to 1%, roughly speaking. Persistent vertigo in about 3 to 7% of patients. Facial nerve injury with resultant facial paralysis, again, about 1 out of 1,000, but again, we use monitors. Change or loss of sense of taste. The risk for cerebral spinal fluid leak and meningitis are higher in this operation because we actually are inside the brain. And this is more so compared to the other procedures that we've talked about. The recover is usually three to seven days in the hospital. With return to work, I've had a truck driver back driving in about three weeks. I've had other people who weren't back to work in about eight weeks. Typically, the younger you are, the more rapid is your recovery. So I have performed this operation in patients as young as 25 years of age and as old as 96. Although both extremes are unusual, most patients will tell me that even years after surgery, they may still feel somewhat dizzy with a rapid head turn or if they step off a curb, they say that, mm, I feel a little bit off. Labyrinthectomy is the gold standard that we compare most operations to. This operation takes about one to two hours, and it's really considered the best of the procedures for vertigo, as it controls symptoms in about 95% of patients at two to five years. The major downside is that you are guaranteed to be deaf in the operated ear, as it essentially wipes out the complete inner ear. So the complications to consider with this are, again, bleeding and infection, hearing loss. Everybody gets hearing loss completely. You can't use a hearing aid. Persistent vertigo, about 5%, so it's the best from the vertigo standpoint. Facial nerve injury, again, is about 1 out of 1,000. Change or loss of sense of taste. Cerebral spinal fluid leak and meningitis are extremely rare. I've never had that occur with that procedure. The hospital stay is usually 1 to 3 days, again, with return to work in 3 to 8 weeks, roughly speaking, some, some quicker, some slower. After surgery, patients will usually experience a severe vertigo for several days. Again, like the other operations, the quicker one can force yourself out to get up and move, the faster you will recover. The last thing I want to talk about as far as surgical treatments for this is gentamicin into the middle ear. This is a procedure that takes 30 minutes or so if you do this in the office. There are several ways to do this. One is in the office, but it usually has to be repeated several times up to even 10 times. Some people will only do it once, but sometimes you need it more. Essentially, we inject gentamicin, which is an antibiotic, or streptomycin through your eardrum towards your inner ear. Gentamicin is toxic to the vestibular system. Versions of this procedure have been done or been in existence for many years. The percentage of complete vertigo control at two to five years is about 75 to 80 percent. In about half of the patients, 40 to 50 percent of the patients, will lose some hearing, and 10 to 20 percent may become deaf, and again, you couldn't use a hearing aid in that ear. The primary complications include bleeding infection, eardrum perforation with need for later repair, hearing loss up to about 40 or 50 percent, or change or loss of sense of taste. Theoretically, it would be possible to have facial nerve injury, but of all the procedures, this is the least likely to result in facial injury. And again, all the other procedures, too, that I've mentioned are fairly rare. Persistent balance problems can also occur. The recovery is similar to the vestibular neurectomy and the labyrinthectomy, specifically gradual improvement over several weeks, three to eight weeks.
There are two newer methods of doing this particular procedure. One is the Silverstein micro wick, which is a tiny wick that goes inside the inner ear. It's fairly inexpensive. It still needs to be done in the operating room. The reason I don't recommend this wholeheartedly is that you can't completely control the dose. You can put drops and you can do this on your own at home, but it's a nice novel way of doing this. The other technique is with a round window microcatheter. Currently, this is the technique that I prefer, and I've probably done the second most number of this in the world, and I've been teaching uh, doctors from across the world and across the country how to do this new procedure. And essentially, this is done in the operating room, and it takes approximately one hour of total time. A small catheter, and I'll show you that catheter, a small catheter is inserted into your inner ear through your eardrum, and it actually goes through your ear in the operating room into the round window, which is a small window into the inner ear. And the medicine is given directly to the inner, inner ear through this little catheter. This was developed by Dr. Irv Ehrenberg, um, and there is actually an in-port and an out-port. And very low doses can be used, which appears to reduce the risk, but not guarantee the risk for hearing loss. You are then hooked up to this pump for 7 to 21 days. Actually, now it's FDA approved for 14 days in the United States. You can use it up to a month in European countries. The longest I've had this in is in uh, four weeks for a patient with hearing loss for a different particular problem. But this pump can then be hooked onto your body and then be left in while this is inside your ear and the medicine is going into the inner ear. One other pump that I'd like to talk to you about is uh, a novel pump, brand new, not available. And this is something that I do in the uh, laboratory. I have a large laboratory and do a lot of research. And this is a, um, it's actually a mini osmotic pump as you can see this. And it's about the size of a coffee stirrer as far as the di diameter. And it's about an inch and a half to two inches long. And this can actually be implanted either in the mastoid cavity and left there permanently. And this actually can deliver 5,000 PSI, 5,000 pounds per square inch. And it's just driven by a difference uh, in salt and, and water and other ions that actually cause the fluid to pump in. And you actually put the fluid inside here, and it gets hooked up to that small catheter, as you can see, blown up over here on the left. And uh, this is actually at the development stages, but we use it in animals, and I've done a lot of work with this in animals. And it's just a matter of time before we'll be able to use something this small uh, in humans. The catheter is then easily removed while in the office. Typically, you will feel off balance for weeks to months with gradual improvement. I used to only recommend the vestibular neurectomy as it had one of the highest rates of reduced vertigo and a low incidence of hearing loss. However, since 1992, I have been offering the sac and the lymphatic sac surgery when hearing is good or the genomycin if hearing is down a bit as a first choice, primarily because both have relatively low risk and there is some suggestion that there may be an improvement in some of the other symptoms associated with Meniere's disease, such as the ear fullness, the hearing loss, and the tinnitus. However, improving these last symptoms is still relatively unlikely, and the primary reason for surgery in any of these cases is to help you with the vertigo. If you have no hearing in the affected ear, a labyrinthectomy is the best option, um, although you could argue having the catheter as well. There are other procedures that can be recommended, but on a much less frequent basis. In summary of the surgical procedures, I would like you to know that I understand that you are probably nervous about this particular problem, and that it is normal to be scared or nervous about any type of surgery. These particular types of surgeries are ones that I have performed many times. I teach residents, medical students, and other doctors from around the country and around the world to do this type of surgery. I've also lectured around the world and published articles related to these subjects. So all in all, I think you are in very good hands. I know you will do well, and I will take the best possible care of you. Our anesthesia and nursing personnel are some of the finest, and I have a great deal of faith and trust in all of them. They will also take wonderful care of you. Please tell me of any of your concerns or questions so I can address them. Uh, some people may get Meniere's disease in the opposite ear. This is one thing I wanted to tell you. That is both ears. Uh, studies have shown that this can occur in as few as 5% of people or in as much as 80% of the people. In 1996, I sent out a survey to all the surgeons who care for patients with Meniere's disease throughout the world and found that most doctors say that about 10 to 15% of patients get it in both ears. Another option in the treatment for dizziness is vestibular rehabilitation. Specifically, we give you exercises designed to strengthen the balance system, and we encourage general exercise provided your medical doctor has cleared you from a health standpoint. Exercises do not help immediately. They take time, possibly as short as six weeks, but usually many months. Performing the exercise program twice daily is typically recommended. 
Over time, the dizziness usually subsides, and on rare occasions, some people may continue to have the episodic spells of vertigo. If the hearing is good, we've talked about the different types of surgery that are available. If it's poor, the labyrinthectomy uh, may be the next most reasonable option. Some patients complain of persistent lightheadedness and wooziness, which are not likely to be improved with surgery and may even become worse. Other common causes of dizziness include benign positional vertigo, which is essentially dizziness that is position related and lasts 15 to 60 seconds at a time. Vestibular neuronitis is where you have a one to three day spell of continuous vertigo with nausea and vomiting and gradual recovery over weeks to months. Interestingly, this only affects your balance and does not cause any hearing symptoms. This is in contrast to labyrinthitis, which causes severe vertigo with nausea and vomiting and hearing loss. The recovery from labyrinthitis takes months to even years. There are hundreds of other possible causes for balance disorders, such as paralymphatic fistula, which is an entity that can mimic Meniere's disease and is relatively uncommon. I was invited to Harvard Medical School in 1988 in Boston to discuss how paralymphatic fistula can mimic Meniere's disease at an international symposium on Meniere's disease. But again, this is a fairly uncommon problem. There is also a disorder called a vascular loop, which is where a loop of a blood vessel pulses on the hearing and balance nerve. And there is a procedure that can be done to correct that as well. There are many other causes for balance disturbances. The most common, besides medication, is metabolic and usually high blood sugar or hypoglycemia, which is low blood sugar. Other associated laboratory disturbances would be high cholesterol, which is a big problem, high lipids or fats, lower high thyroid, the drugs and medications we had talked about, as well as allergies may cause some balance problems for some people. As you can see from this detailed discussion, there are many causes of balance disorders. Some are easy to sort out, while other causes are quite elusive. Few things in life are as frustrating as a chronic or a long-term balance problem, whether it is constant or episodic. Many people feel as though they have lost control over essential body functions. Some cannot drive or do routine activities of daily living. Some have experienced fatigue or problems concentrating. Some people begin to feel anxious or depressed and wonder if they are going crazy, pardon the expression. These emotional responses are normal reactions to a chronic balance problem or any other kind of chronic problem. It is important that you realize that emotional stress or any kind of stress makes this or any medical problem worse. But it is also important for many people to realize that this emotional stress is indeed a normal response, and for some this makes the overall problem a bit easier to deal with. Fortunately for most people with dizziness, the problem is not a serious one, but it is a nuisance that must be coped with from time to time. It is important to realize that sometimes a specific diagnosis can be made for dizziness, and other times we cannot. Often it is difficult to explain your problem to your friends and family because they cannot see your actual problem. In these instances, psychological counseling is often helpful in dealing with these aspects of the problem. I would like to tell you that I understand that it is a very difficult problem for you. I am eager to help. Having said this, you must also realize that even after a detailed history, a detailed examination, and appropriate testing, we often cannot tell you what exactly is wrong. So as physicians and healthcare providers, it is frustrating for me to not be able to tell you absolutely what's wrong. Likewise, I, I know it's very frustrating for you. Out of 100 patients with dizziness, after a careful search, we can come up with a diagnosis in about 50 or 60 percent of those patients. The other 40 to 50 percent, we often shrug our shoulders, apologize, and tell you simply, we don't know why you have this problem. This has been probably one of the major impetuses for me to learn about non-Western medical options. What I mean by this is complementary and alternative medicine, which I abbreviate through the rest of this talk as CAM. We must realize that medicine as you and I understand it does not have all the answers. We need to learn from our colleagues in Asia, Germany, Pakistan, and India, for example. With this in mind, and with my Bachelor of Science degree in Nutrition, and the fact that I've studied herbs since 1981, I very much think of alternative options. So I have several chiropractors, acupunctures, uh, people who do St. John's neuromuscular therapy, and herbalists that I work with. I have had many patients achieve improvement when traditional medicine or medical ways have failed. To me, this is a teamwork approach. I want to make sure first that you do not have anything dangerous going on. I then want to find out, if possible, what you have and then treat you appropriately. Several alternative options include chiropractic medicine where they manipulate the spine and the neck, uh, acupuncture where they put small needles inside you, 
uh, and they stimulate those needles and they work along meridians or planes. St. John's neuromuscular therapy is a treatment that sort of argues a bit against chiropractic and what they believe is that a chiropractor can adjust your spine and put it back in but the muscles in your body are constantly pulling them back out. So a St. John's neuromuscular therapist actually works to move the muscles and realign the muscles and then they say that the spine will follow. It's a very intriguing methodology and they've had wonderful success with migraine headaches and other chronic disorders and I've had some of my patients have improvement with their balance problems. Also massage therapy, general massage therapy and herbal therapy and there are many other options that can be used. I'd like to talk to you about some specific nutrients that may be beneficial for vertigo problems or dizziness. As you can see from the list, there are many things here, such as magnesium, which can come from grain, nuts, beans, and greens and vegetables, calcium, potassium, lipoflavonoids is an interesting one and has been used, also B vitamins, multivitamin supplements are also available. Also, there are many herbs that can be helpful to treat vertigo, and this is a list of them, such as ginkgo biloba, which has been shown to improve circulation, Alzheimer's, cognition, tinnitus, and vertigo. You have to be careful if you're on an anticoagulant, such as heparin or coumadin. And rarely you can have GI upset, but that's particularly with the off-brands. The primary dosing that I typically recommend is 240 milligrams twice a day, but the bottle usually says 40 to 60 milligrams. The German Commission E clearly says that 240 milligrams twice a day is very much appropriate or patients with balance problems or ringing in the ear uh, when we're talking about ginkgo. Ginseng is another excellent herb. It has been shown to be beneficial for fatigue, depression, stress, general well-being, sexual energy, and digestion. It is important to avoid it if you have high blood pressure or diabetes, and these are relative contraindications as well as pregnancy. High doses can cause insomnia, anxiety, and stomach upset. You also do not want to use this with anticoagulants like heparin or Coumadin, for example. The dosage is typically 100 to 300 milligrams, one to three times per day. Blessed thistle is another herb, and the standard dosage is about two to three dropperfuls, two to three times per day, or up to four to six grams per day. I'd like to talk to you about hawthorn. Hawthorn is actually something that's very good for the heart. It's beneficial for atherosclerosis, which is hardening of the arteries, heart arrhythmias, abnormal rhythms, high blood pressure. It actually improves the cardiac output, which means the output of the heart and coronary or heart blood flow. There are no contraindications, so you can pretty much use it with anything, although you should not use it if you're taking digoxin, digitalis, same type of drug. It can be mildly sedative, and there are no specific interactions with the exception of the digitalis, and also foxglove is an herb that digitalis is made from. The standard dosage is about 160 to 900 milligrams uh, per day. Gotu cola is another important herb which is very good for memory and hypothyroidism, but it's also good for people with some balance problems. The standard dosage is about 50 to 600 milligrams per day. Cocculus compositum, also called vertigo heal, it has these primary ingredients. Cocculus indicus, conium maculatum, which is actually poison hemlock, ambergrisia, which is a portion of whale liver, and petroleum. This is a homeopathic remedy that actually activates vestibular regulatory systems and the brainstem. There was a double-blinded placebo-controlled study to show it being as effective as CERC, which is a drug that's used in Canada, and both of them were significantly better than placebo. There are no contraindications, meaning you can use it without any problems, and there's no adverse reactions. Normally they'll tell you do not use for more than 10 days if you have a balance problem without the permission from your doctor, but I always recommend it and people have been on it for years and years without any problems. Another new thing that I had found recently as I was asked to write an article for the Loringa Scope um, is a compound called Divertigo. This is a combination of seven highly concentrated oils. What you do is you put a few drops, you rub it behind each ear, and they claim that 80% of the people using the product have resolution of their vertigo. So if anybody is interested, it's relatively inexpensive on the order of $15 to $20 for a bottle. Um, these are things that are not really well tested, and so I'm putting them out there for you to consider. Other alternatives for vertigo would include such things as acupuncture or acupressure, moxibustion, that's where they put needles in and actually light the needles at the end on fire, sort of, um, osteopathic adjustments or chiropractic manipulation, as we've talked about, St. John's neuromuscular therapy, meditation and relaxation therapy, 
and either some, uh, some people feel that magnets may be of some benefit uh, as well. Um, either myself or one of my colleagues will be in to talk with you to answer any additional questions or concerns that you may have. Additionally, we have this text written down for you so that you can review it at your leisure or refer back to. Also, I am here to help you to the best of my ability and I look forward to working with you. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video and have a great day.